journey there. God will not let us go. Every trial that tempts our hearts to fear, He'll use to give us hope. All creation. pray at this time to our glorious and great God we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ who has accomplished everything for us I do pray that your name will be honored and praised and lifted up as we go before your word I pray that by your spirit you'll open our minds and our hearts to receive what you have to say but as your people who are called to be responsible may we open and be thoughtful and cognitive of the importance of hearing your word as it is spoken to us in Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Well, the word of God in First Thessalonians, just to give you a passage in uh, chapter 5, verse 18. Uh, it says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And of course, all circumstances will include what you and I may classify as good. And then the other category of thanksgiving in all circumstances is the one that you may prefer to do without. But to give thanks is a general declaration to God that he is worthy to be praised. It is one that involves a heartfelt conviction of that truth that as God's will is for you to thank him, that you believe that he's truly involved in every affair of your life. And so you're not just processing a passage of Scripture, as it were, to say, well, Lord, uh, you said to give thanks, so here goes everything. But it is actually a heartfelt a gratitude that is expressed from your inner man and also from your lips. It is what we would call a spontaneous act of thanksgiving uh, to God under every circumstance. Well, we are all guilty in some form of not doing that as we should for thanking God for and in everything. In order to do so, it means that God, and remember this, that God is the reason for your thanksgiving. It is not what he has done as such, but for who he is. And that is when thanksgiving is truly at its purest. But for us, unfortunately, we oftentimes need a reason instead to give thanks, and there are occasions for that. But Scripture reveals that thanksgiving to God in its richest and purest form requires no occasion, nor does it require a scheduled event. A thanksgiving to God can be done in everything, from the daily provision of air to breathe to the simple meal on the table, sufficient clothing to wear, but most of all, thanksgiving and praise to God for who He is. And in that, all that he has done and will do according to his purposes for his glory, whether or not in your particular estimate it is favorable towards you, that you're praising God 
for who he is. Well, I would say that it is fitting then to realign your thanksgiving, is it not? To the simplicity of focusing on one person, and that is on God. But yet from that simplicity comes a truth that you believe should be acknowledged that God deserves to be praised. He deserves to be adored and glorified no matter what happens in life. So I would say we all need to recalibrate our thanksgiving to God. And note that I did not say the world needs to do so. We should recognize that the world is unthankful. They are ungrateful. But it is so easy for us, especially during this time of the year, to find everything wrong with the world and trying to restore Christmas to some respectability before the world or thanksgiving before the world. But what about the Christian? What about those who are called to fear and to love God? The real change is to be in God's people. God's people are called to be thankful. We know that apart from Christ, we could not give thanks. Because we did not know God, we refused to acknowledge God as God. We became thankful. We became ungrateful. But for those who know God and have come to know God in Christ Jesus, we now have the opportunity to be thankful in every circumstance of life. Well, turn to Psalm 100 with me this evening. We read that passage this morning, but I think uh, this the psalm is just the passage where you will be encouraged to align your response to all circumstances, no matter what it is with thanksgiving. And there's enough of us to have more than one circumstance that is not easy to navigate through, not easy to deal with, whether it's, it is the circumstantial struggles we have with people or events or condition, uh, whatever it may be, that our thanksgiving to God needs to be seen as something larger than the momentary benefits or struggles that you may face. Furthermore, the reason to give thanks does not begin with what God has done or will do, albeit that is important. And the psalmist at times will say that, God, if you were to do this, I will praise you and give you thanks. But in this text, the purest form of thanksgiving is when you praise God first of all for who he is that you're able to praise God and give him thanks because uh, he is God. In fact, that is one of the main points you find in this psalm. If you just were to survey the psalm, it's a joyful noise to the Lord, to Yahweh, serve Yahweh with gladness, come into his presence, which refers to God. Know that Yahweh, he is God. He who is God has made us, and we are his. We are God's. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture, his gates with thanksgiving, his course with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. Uh, you know that this psalm is about God. How do we apply our lives in thanksgiving to God, not just for what he's done, but ultimately beyond that for who he is? But do remember who God is factors into what he does and what he will do. But Christians, believers, or worshipers in this context under the old covenant are called to worship God, not only for what he's done, but he is king, he is a ruler, he is a shepherd, uh, he is indeed the creator and the one and only true God. Well, just a few details about this psalm. The psalm 100 is what we would call a descriptive psalm, praise psalm. Uh, it is when someone praises or thanks God for who God is and for what God does in general. Without a specific reference to what may have been a need on their part. So a descriptive praise is not connected to a personal need, but it's a general observation, a general acknowledgement, a general act of thanksgiving to God for who he is and his works. Whether God is answering that specific need as you see he should answer or not, he's still praised for who he is as God. Another important note about Psalm 100 is that it is what seems to be the climax of this section of Psalms, beginning with the 93rd Psalm, where Yahweh is crowned as king. This section is called the Theocratic Psalm, where God is the ruler, or it's called the Enthronement Psalms, beginning with Psalm 93 and on. You will see in several of those Psalms, it says that God reigns. 
that God is, is the ruler. He is, he's the supreme uh, king. Therefore, he's worthy of thanksgiving. He's worthy of worship. And not only that, even in this psalm, but more so in Psalm 95, those who are rebelling against God are called to turn from their sins and turn to this true and living God. Another point to be made about this psalm, this psalm was an inspired psalm, but it was also applied to thanksgiving services, which is fitting for our occasion. And according to history, that thanksgiving occasion would include not only the sacrifice that was appropriate to the occasion, but also God's people would gather together over a thanksgiving meal. And in fact, when you look at this psalm, Psalm 100 is the only psalm of its kind where the superscription says, a psalm for giving thanks, or in the New American Standard Version, a psalm for thanksgiving. So in God's providence, it fits well for occasions like this. And so I've called this message entitled, A God-Glorifying Thanksgiving. How do we glorify God and give Him thanks? This psalm, although it is applied to the earth in general, and we know that specifically it's for God's people because only God's people can respond with thanksgiving, exaltation, and adoration even if what they're facing seems to be twisted, difficult, hard, unbearable because we can thank God unconditionally because of His Spirit that is in us. Of course, at the end of this psalm, you realize that you're proclaiming thanksgiving to God, not only that, uh, verse 4, give thanks to him, bless his name, for he is good. The conclusion of every event in life, we can say that our God is good. Therefore, you and I can rejoice in him. We can thank him. So, beloved, if you believe you have very little material in life to be thankful for, if you are under the impression that there are some unbearable conditions in your life right now, just remember this. Remember the goodness of the Lord. The psalmist says, be thankful unto him and bless his name. Honor him, for he alone is infinitely good. Therefore, he alone is infinitely worthy of all thanksgiving. As you're sitting here this evening, God has been good to you and continues to be good to you. For those who are saved, you ought to grow in knowing that more and more that God is good, that God is infinitely good to those who are worthy of nothing but damnation. But that is also true for the unbeliever. Even though you, unbeliever, may not acknowledge it, God continues to show goodness to you. Even as you plot sin in your own mind, it's amazing that someone who is an unbeliever under the very presence of the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the truth that God is literally here with us, and God is, is good not to strike them dead to prove it, because if He were to do it to prove to them that He's, he's the true living God, they will perish in hell. But in His grace, He allows them to live day by day by day, and even in this moment, they may be plotting sin in their heart that God still shows his goodness toward them. And even some of us who are saved and we have been granted this grace in salvation, we from time to time still plot sin in our minds in the very midst of God's good presence. And one of those plotting of sins is say, well, I don't know if I have anything to give thanks for. When the scripture says not only think about giving thanks, because it doesn't say that. It says, I am commanding you to give thanks. And in this command comes the joyful response of the Spirit's enabling to give thanks because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. One of the attributes, the adjectives of this joy is rejoicing. It is giving thanks to God. But all for the sinner, as they plot out this sin, not submitting to Christ, in fact, is to plan out a life of sin, but yet God is still good to you. Patient, desiring in his goodness to give you the opportunity and the time to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Well, let us turn to the text for a, a few a moments. We're just going to look at the verses 1 through 3. Three exhortations for God-glorifying thanksgiving. For you to glorify God 
And that thanksgiving for the believer is not an occasion. It is indeed a way of life. I mean, is your life characterized uh, by habitual thanksgiving? Thanksgiving is the way of life for those who fear and love God. Well, first of all, the first exhortation is in verse 1, and it is a call to rejoice to God, to rejoice to God. The psalmist says, you ought to make your joyful noise to the Lord. All the earth, serve the Lord with gladness, come into into his presence with singing. But verse 1, rejoicing to God. This is the exhortation, and if you have noticed in this passage, there are several imperatives here, several commands. Or to put it in a a positive, a sanctifying sense, several exhortations. And that we're not called to think about this, but we're called to do this. But remember, it is a response to a good God. It is a response to God as creator. It is a response to God as king. It is a response to God as the supreme ruler. Also notice in this text that this begins in his presence. In verse 2, come into his presence with singing, into his courts with praise. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Well, what is this joyful noise? It is the typical cry of victory. And here what God's people are called to do is express an exuberant, emphatic, excitable response to God. As I said this morning that these responses are never absent of emotion, but they are emotions that are filled with truth, saturated with truth, soaked with truth. That the the natural response of this divine impartation by the Spirit of God and in this truth is to be truly joyful in who God is. A very similar exhortation is in Psalm 47, verse 1. All people are called to shout to God with loud songs, uh, songs of joy. He says, For the Lord Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. The twin passage to Psalm 100, the 95th Psalm, verses 1 through 2. Oh, come, let us sing uh, to God, to Yahweh, the covenant faithful God. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. And a joyful noise is a joyful noise. It is audible. It is a sound. It, It resonates, but it resonates with truth. It says, let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. And that's what we do when we gather and sing. We're singing songs of praise. And as we're singing, we're making a joyful noise. So all who are in this room who have been saved by God's grace in Christ Jesus ought to be heard singing or sounding out. It didn't say make a joyful scale. Because if we're singing in the major scale, we don't want a gypsy minor. We want you to sing in the major scale. But beloved, it says a joyful noise. It doesn't matter if you're on scale, off scale, on beat, off beat. It's a joyful noise in song. Leave the melody up to the Holy Spirit. You just open up your lips and say something. It's a joyful noise unto the Lord. And it doesn't matter what the occasion is to thank God. The psalmist says that this God is your rock. He's your salvation. That's always true, so you don't need an event. You just need to remember God and who He is and what He's done. Well, the New Testament equivalent is in Philippians 4, verse 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoicing to God, fill your thanksgiving with rejoicing to God. Fill your day. Every day for the Christian is thanksgiving. We don't have enough time to give God thanks. 
In fact, there should never be a moment where we are not ready, prepared, and acting actively in giving God thanks. There should never be a moment. But as I would assert, we are chronic complainers. And then we'll try to make it sacred and say, well, I don't mean to complain. <laughs> but that's exactly what we are doing. And when we complain, we no longer are in a position to give God thanks. But our day should be filled with thanksgiving to God. And, and what, a, what a sign, what a testimony to the world that we can thank God in everything, in spite of everything. They will inevitably begin to ask questions. How is it possible for you to give God thanks so regularly knowing what you're going through? Because God is good. Because God is good. Secondly, beloved, verse 2, the second exhortation for God-glorifying thanksgiving is to fill your thanksgiving with a willing service to God. A willing service to God. Verse 2, the very beginning, it says, Serve the Lord with gladness. It is very nice that this second exhortation doesn't say first come, although that is in very important, but it begins with serving the Lord with gladness. This serving, beloved, is, is a reference uh, to the worship that you would give to God, the service you would give to God, but also the life that you live for God. It never exclude, excludes the living with the lip service. But it's the lip service, the activity that you would do when you gather corporately, but also what you do when you tell God's people goodbye. We'll see you next week, Lord willing. Is that the next day that you will actually serve God next Sunday? Or is that your life? I want you to remember this service and worship are often synonymous in Scripture. Romans 12, verse 1, for example, says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of service, act of worship. It is your lifestyle. In other words, this is a comprehensive term that what you say and what you do are all related to your worship. And so when you look at this, you can't separate the two. What you say and what you do comprises the totality of this service or this worship to God. So the point is words and works are conjoined realities. There is no gap between the worship, the words, and the work. The worship is the same. The words should be a harmonious and so the work should be the same. Everything that you do is now a service to God. And so to serve this way is to speak and to live, and it is harmonious. Well, it also says how you ought to do so. If you feel like, I will do, I will serve the Lord, I want to do it, uh, but it's sad, it's disappointing. Uh, I don't know if I really like it. it it's hard. I'm not saying the Christian life isn't easy, but it says still in this command, serve the Lord with what? Gladness. Gladness. Now here's where this gladness come fr comes from. This gladness is not a circumstantial gladness. This gladness of heart that you have, that I would have, is in what we have received from God, knowing that we are right with Him. And here is where service is pure, that you are, have a right standing with God by faith. And you serve Him with gladness. You're no longer guilty before God. Your life of obedience before God it, is not a meritorious effort. It is, it is a zeal and a response of love and gratitude to God. 
So because your life is in harmony with God, by the Spirit of God and by the Word of God, you know that according to God's Word, He's leading you in paths of righteousness, and by His grace you can submit to that truth. The gladness flows from this truth. So everyone who is saved can serve Yahweh, serve God with gladness. The psalmist goes on to say, come into his presence with singing. This come is a call for you to worship him, literally in his, into his presence or in his presence. Come before the very face of God is the idea. Come before his presence. But it says to do so with singing, shouts of joy, songs of joy, joyful songs, songs that you know are true of God, that are true and also are heartfelt truths in that you can sing with conviction. So as joyful singing as you come into his presence. And this is the right approach to true worshiping of God. Gladness of heart that God has saved and redeemed you. And you come into his presence with singing because now you have access to God. And imagine the Old Testament believers saying this. Believing that they have access to God and this has to be by grace. How much more under the new covenant do we know this to be true? But beloved, is this sufficient? Is this sufficient for you and I? Everything that is happening in your life, in this world, we are not denying it, nor are we marginalizing it, but are we saying this, the superiority of knowing that you have fellowship with God, that you can come in His presence, that you can rejoice in Him, is that not enough? Indeed, I say it is. But we need to be recalibrated, realigned, in trimming the layers of what we think we are either entitled to or we deserve, and realizing that we don't even deserve lips to praise Him, a mind to praise Him, nor do we deserve a will to praise Him. We've been given all three. What a blessing. What an honor. And the response of the Christian is to give God a thanks every day. Well, we also need to know that the Word of God must deepen our reservoir for this holy affection. Uh, to be moved by God's Word. But another point I want to make in coming to this presence that this procession, it is visible. God's people are marching in towards the temple, the tabernacle. It pictures the God's people as they are coming to worship. But not only that, this is a snapshot of the attitude of those who are coming to worship God. That they're coming into His presence with singing. Of course, there's the organized, the preparational aspect of the singing, but they are ready, as it were. And that's part of the idea, I believe, that you find in this text. They are ready to come into His presence with singing. They have a reason to come. And although it is good to be assisted by the music and, and the singing, if, if that is what you need uh, to come into God's presence, that's not true coming at all. The attitude is I'm ready to worship God and the musicians and the singers are coming to assist in what I already desire to do. Remember, if you need the music and the singing to get you going, that's an attitude problem. And that's more psychological than it is spiritual. If every Christian, every follower of Christ were to prepare themselves, and sometimes it may have to begin early. In fact, it does. It begins every day. and continues on into Saturday. I wonder what your Saturdays and Sunday mornings are like. Are you like boots on an anthill, scattering all throughout the house, trying to find that shoelace? that was removed by Junior Junebug? <laughs> or have you prepared yourself to worship God so much? I, I know that I have to get this done in order to be ready. Or is this a last-minute event? Oh, I, I'm not here to trouble you. We're getting ready to eat soon. But we must feast, first of all, on the bittersweet truth. That this involves the attitude of the one who's coming. 
that there is this sense of preparation made to meet the almighty, living, and righteous God. You don't just slap yourself together. You prepare yourself to meet the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the true living and holy God. Oh, what passivity, what laxity, what laid backness. And please, I don't want to hear it's part of being in the city. Blah, blah, blah. That's, ba- that's Babel discussion. That's, that's Genesis 11 discussion. That's, that's Babel. It has nothing to do with the culture. It is the condition of the heart. Now, I am not saying that you have to wear a suit because <laughs> many of you may be quite uncomfortable. It's the preparation of the heart. Are you prepared? Might it include the apparel? It depends on how you view apparel. Many of us worship the suit. Therefore, you ought not to wear it. There are those of you who do not worship the suit. You probably ought to wear something different. But you worship casual living. But oftentimes, there's a casual attitude, not connected with what you wear. But there are times when how we prepare to meet God is a reflection on how we look when we come here on Sundays. It is not the central. It is never the most important. But beloved, in God, I want you to remember everything matters. Now, if the Christian says, well, at least I'm here, they're missing the whole point of coming. For you to say, well, at least I'm showing up. That's what I expect the unbeliever to say, but not the Christian. Not at all. Not the one who realizes that God is infinitely good and worthy of all praise. But it is also a willing service to God that you serve him with your words, your worship, and your work. Imagine going to see the great leaders of the world. In fact, when athletes visit the president, what are they wearing? They may look stuffed, they may look uncomfortable, but because of the office and the respect and dignity that they give to the president, they are dressed accordingly. Now, there's a caution for the Christian. It is the apparel of the heart. What happens is what the Old Testament was in the shadow and the visible appearance now becomes the heart. How does the heart prepare to meet God? And so if you walk away thinking that I'm calling everyone to dress up, you're missing the whole point. I'm saying each person in this room must examine how they prepare and if this preparation is truly one who is giving, willing, glad, joyful service to God. That's the point. It's going to look differently for for some of us. I mean, there are those of you who may dress up in a suit today and may come in shorts next week because you know your attitude is not right. But there are those who may change after thinking deeply about their attitude in preparation to worship God. That's the point I want to make. So please don't come to me and, and tell me that I need to buy your suit. That's not the point. It's your willing service to God involves every part of you. And if you are not making necessary preparations to meet with God, on a day-to-day basis, and even when we gather, then that may be a sign of a lack of true ga- gratitude that God deserves your best in every phase of your life. Well, for the sake of time, let's move on to the third exhortation for God-glorifying thanksgiving is a desire to know God. And sadly, this one will take the longest, and I'm going to have to speed up a bit. But it is very important to your God-glorifying thanksgiving is a desire to know God. Verse 3 says, Know that the Lord, He is God. And there are many who would call this verse the centerpiece of Psalm 100. That all of your rejoicing, all of your service, yes, it is based on what you know about God. In fact, the exhortation to do is based on what you know God has done, who God is. 
to that point, the exhortation in Romans 12, verse 1, is based on God's work, His providence, His sovereignty, everything in chapters 1 through 11 of Romans. The more you know, it changes your service to God. The more you know, it changes your response to God. The more you know of God, it changes the glory you give to God. So such knowledge, therefore, becomes the basis for joyful, willing, and God-exalting thanksgiving. Well, what does it mean to know God? Well, to know God, it means that you're growing and becoming deeply acquainted with who He is. Deeply acquainted. And let me remind you that this, the, the most important thing for you to remember from this is that it involves every aspect of your knowing God. The intellect, the will, and the emotion. That's the encompassing truth of knowing God. If knowing God doesn't move you to do something, that's not the knowing God of Scripture. That's having an idea about God, a concept about God, a philosophy about God, but a true sanctifying, life-changing knowledge of God moves the will and the emotion is seen in obedience. That's the acquaintance. As you grow in this depth of knowing God through Christ Jesus, that's the transforming truth. Well, I want to present a few concepts or truths on what it means to know God. Well, first of all, to know God, and this is never a comprehensive truth, but it is one nonetheless. It is always progressive. But to know God is to know his attributes. To know God is to know his attributes. This God is a God of mercy, a God of justice, righteousness, a God who is holy, loving, and kind. Not only that, a God who must and will punish sin. This is involved in knowing God. In fact, to know God in this text is to also know that he has made you. This, many believe, may refer to the nation of Israel, that God made them or called them out. But this, I believe, also refers to God in making everyone, all the earth, but also specifically those who are redeemed, that you belong to God. But what do we say of the unbeliever? The unbeliever is still responsible to him. But those who have been saved by his grace are willingly responsible to answer to his commands and to his word because he is the one who has made us. In fact, this text says, Know that the Lord, that he is Elohim, he is God, which refers uh, back to creation. So not only is the God who created, but it's the God who saved uh, this uh, God. You are called to know his attributes. And to know God in this way can only be known by those who are saved. But not only that, to know God is to know his attributes. Secondly, to know God involves your personal confession. Your personal confession. Specifically, this also implied from this text, is a confession of faith in God that he is your God. In fact, that he is the only true God. Know you that the Lord, he is God. This is a confession of faith. That he himself is God. That you believe that to be true. That he not only is the creator and savior. It wasn't a different God in creation who is the God who redeems and saved. You belong to him. That's another implication of this personal confession. That you belong exclusively to God. And that he has made you. And what does it mean that he has made you? Well, that is inferred in the third point to know God, that he has made you, is to know that what he has done is all by his grace. That is all a grace of God. That if it's the God who made you, you also come to recognize it is the God who has redeemed you. Because if you are his people and the sheep of his pasture, it means that he is also your savior. 
King James Version, which I learned Psalm 100 from the King James Version, says, He has made us and not we ourselves. We didn't make ourselves. God is the one who made us. It was all God's choice. But think about this as God who made us and God who shepherds you. The shepherding aspect is the aspect of salvation. Therefore, if you were not created by your own doing, you were not chosen by your own doing. This is all of God. Here, once again, the Christian pauses and gives all praises to God because the implication of this psalm is so much more greater in the person of Jesus Christ. He who has made you is also, he has called you to be his sheep and he becomes your shepherd. Knowing this God. But we must move quickly Fourthly, to know God is to acknowledge his kingship. That you are his, his rule. You're his people. In fact, as I mentioned throughout this psalm, it speaks of the Lord's reigning, the Lord's kingship. That as king, he rules over your life. But there's gladness, there's joy, there's singing, there's exaltation, there's thanksgiving. There's comfort in knowing that he's king. But I must move into the fifth one to know God is to acknowledge him as your shepherd. He is your shepherd. It says that he's that you are the sheep of his pasture at the end of verse four. I'm sorry, verse three. You are his and the sheep of his pasture. That you are the flock under God's gracious care. Uh, therefore, to do this is to do so in subjection to him. That you submitted to him. And in submitting to him, you also receive the blessings of being in his care. And how much more of certainty does this present to those who are in Christ Jesus? But I have to make a quick pause at this point and make the appeal to those who are yet to submit to God. What thanksgiving should flow from our hearts when unbelievers are granted life and salvation in him? Because the psalmist says in Psalm 95, verse 6, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is God and we are the sheep of his pasture, the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. But notice in verse 7, at the end of verse 7, today if you hear his voice, as Israel's hard-heartedness is presented here, do not harden your hearts. God says, your fathers put me to the test. He's speaking to the rebellious one. Don't continue to be indifferent, partaking of God's blessing, eating of his provisions, sleeping on his time, under his care, living within his daily grace, yet refusing to submit to him. Don't continue to do so. And if that is you this evening, I pray that the voice of God from the pages of his word and the presence of his spirit will draw you to him so that you can rejoice and give God thanks as he is worthy. That you will hear the call of this truth, turn and repent from your sin and believe in Jesus Christ. But I will conclude the reading, the rest of this Psalm 100 by reading it so that we can continue to rejoice, enter in his gates with thanksgiving and in his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Let us pray. Oh, Father in heaven, you said, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am Yahweh who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for I delight in these things. And Paul, when he spoke of knowledge, spoke of the foolishness of the gospel, including the scandal of a virgin's birth, the scandal of the incarnation, the scandal of a man dying on the cross as God in the flesh. Yet that is the message we preach and we boast only in Christ alone. And it is through him that you have chosen to save us by your grace and love us uh, through Christ Jesus. I pray that you would now show mercy, a pity to the one who yet continues to rebel against you. O oh God of heaven, save them by your grace and for your glory. 
as we bless your name by showing gratitude and honoring you, declaring that you alone are sufficient for every day. You alone are sufficient for every day to be a day of thanksgiving. And as we prepare to feast together in your presence, I pray that this time will be one of great joy and praise uh, to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, we'll uh, just uh, take a, a quick pause for the next few minutes.